Daniel Crosslink, welcome back to yet another video. This is my review of the Ender 3 V2 and we're starting right now. So first I want to welcome you back to 2021 for another video. I hope you're ready. I hope you're all healthy. Uh, I think this is important in these times. We still can't get haircuts in Germany, so you have to deal with it. And this is the Ender 3 V2. We're talking about it today. I've been using it over the vacation for about 150 hours of test prints. All these nice things here I've printed and we're going to talk about the results in this video. I also made two other videos previously about this printer, the build process, and I released a time-lapse video so you can see in detail how these prints look like from the ground up. If you're interested in that, watch them after if you've watched this video. As usual, if you're just interested in seeing a specific part of this review, use the video chapters. I've also put them in the description of this video so you can skip to the part that you're interested in mostly. First, I want to say a few words about the build process. As usual and as expected, it took about 30 to 40 minutes and the manual that they deliver with the printer is really concise and easy to understand. So I think for even beginners, this is a printer that everyone can build and there is no questions open. Now a few words about the build quality. The frame is still a very high quality. It has a little bit improved over the previous versions, but it's still very comparable. For example, this metal frame here seems to be exactly the one from the Ender 3 Pro. All the parts fit together flush and tightly, and I had no issues mounting it. There wasn't any skewed parts. So I'm really happy with the sturdiness and the quality of that frame. The extruder itself is still made from plastic. However, they did a little design change. The inlet where the filament comes in, there is now a metal insert that will prevent the extruder inlet from wearing out over time. There's also some other design changes that I really appreciate. First of all, the power supply went into the base frame, so everything is now really nice and sleek and nothing is dangling around here on the side of the frame anymore. We also have little covers for the Y-axis motor, for example, and that Y-axis switch. Nice design changes also here. We also have two belt tensioners now for the X and Y-axis. These are additional upgrade parts you can also get for your end of the Pro or the V1, but it's really appreciated that they did this for the V2. At the front of the printer, we have a little toolbox, a drawer, where you can keep all your stuff replacement parts, tools, nozzles, anything that you want. So it's all in a central place nearby the printer, it doesn't get lost. One thing I wish they would have changed is the design of the spool holder. This is still the same one as in the V1, still have the same issues. Large spools sometimes don't fit on that. And I always have a little bit of fear that the spool might fall from that, but it's not changed. So you have to upgrade this yourself. The Bowden extrusion system is basically unchanged from the previous versions. However, in the M3 Pro and also here in the V2, you have now a tightening screw so you can increase the pressure of the transporting gear against the filament. But that's everything that is different from the V1 and you still will have to upgrade the extruder system either to a Metal Gear extruder or you will have to apply the upgrade that Chap did on his channel for the extruder to be able to print TPU flexible material reliably. Otherwise the flex material is going to escape that pass pretty easily. So that's an upgrade to apply if you want to go for that. Now what's also changed in the V2 versus the Pro and the V1 is the addition of the glass plate. So it's now included by default. Previously it was an upgrade that you had to purchase from Creality separately or you get a glass plate somewhere else. Now it's included and the adhesion on this glass plate is surprisingly well. Sometimes actually too good, especially if you print larger parts, it gets harder to remove things from the glass plate. So you have to use the blade that comes with the printer. And that is also a little bit of an issue because you're scratching the surface pretty easily. So I'm not sure how the long-term impacts of scratches on our surface is, we're gonna see in the long-term. But for now I can say it's really surprisingly good. I'm not a big fan of glass plates, by the way. I'm using spring steel bed mostly on all of my printers 
And um, if I had to choose between a glass plate and a spring steel bed, still I would choose the spring steel surface, but this is surprisingly good, as I said. The surface is really, really flat. There is no visible bumps or dips. And if you do the bed leveling in the corners, you're also getting very good results in the middle that tells me that you actually probably don't need a beel touch sensor or any kind of bed leveling sensor. And so there's no real reason to operate. However, one little thing about the glass plate, you're losing a little bit of print area in the front and in the back because of the clips that hold the glass plate in place. So if you really want to go to the maximum extension of the print bed, you will have to switch it out for something like a spring steel surface. One of the most apparent changes in the V2 is the new screen. It's now a vertical screen, it's a color screen, and it's not a touch screen, although you might think it is, but from looking at the icons, you would might think that you can touch them actually because they are so large, but that's not unfortunately a touch screen. Although I appreciate a color screen as an upgrade, it has a few little issues. For example, the viewing angles. If you want to see what's on the screen and you want to use the menu to select something, it gets really, really hard if you're just a little bit deviating to the side and trying to see what's actually highlighted. The contrast is really, really low and you can't see what's highlighted. So that's one issue. Another issue is that you can't see what's happening with the printer if you're not printing from the SD card. So usually when you print from the SD card, you can see the temperature, the progress, and messages that come to the display. But if you're using Octoprint, like I'm doing with basically all of my printers, there's no way to see the status and any messages that Octoprint sends to the printer. That is hidden and that's a little bit unfortunate. One of the most important and interesting upgrades on the V2 is the 32-bit mainboard. So every Creality Endo printer is gonna get a 32-bit mainboard now, but they are slightly different. And on the V2, we get the new 32-bit mainboard with the 2208 silent drivers. So this is supposed to make the print process more silent. We're gonna talk about noise levels in a bit, but Besides having silent drivers and having the 32-bit processor, it also has two additional upgrade ports. One is for the Beal Touch sensor, where you can just plug in the cable for the Beal Touch right in here. It's a nice upgrade. And there's a second additional plug for a filament runout sensor. So this is things that I'm gonna test out in the future, adding the Beal Touch and a filament runout sensor. Another plus of a 32-bit mainboard is having more program memory. Because on the old mainboards, we had all kinds of issues fitting all the features that we wanted into that little tiny space of program memory. Now with the 32-bit mainboard, you have enough memory for all the features that you ever wanted on this printer. Another really big plus for the 32-bit mainboards. If you're still on a V1 or a Pro version of the Ender 3, you can get this upgrade board now as a separate part. It's then the 427 version. And we're gonna talk about installing this new mainboard on the Ender 3 Pro in another video. So if you wanna buy this as a separate upgrade part, I've linked it in the description of this video. When I built this printer for the first time, the firmware that was on the mainboard was a pretty outdated version, so I upgraded it to the latest version. However, I was hoping for some features and there's some very basic features missing in that firmware, unfortunately. First one, I expected to have level bed corners. This is a function, if you don't know it, that makes it very easy to do the corner leveling. So the print nozzle moves around the print surface, just moving in the corners, and then you can adjust the tightening of that surface against the nozzle. And that is missing, uh, although you can do this manually, but there's always the problem that you either have to move it through the menu, that's a very tedious process, or you have to disable the steppers and then we're running into the danger that you're moving actually the Z-axis up and down unintendedly. So I wish they had included this little feature. Another thing that's missing, in my opinion, an important menu item from Marlin is the filament change. This can be added in Marlin pretty easily. And the last thing that's missing, it's also basically a free upgrade if you enable it in Marlin, is the nine point mesh bed living. I wish they would have included all these features. There is no harm in doing that, but they didn't. So watch out for my Marlin 2.0 upgrade video for the Ender 3 V2 mainboard. 
So as I said in the beginning, I did about 150 hours of prints on this printer already, and we're gonna talk about the print quality now. So the first test print was the Benji. Let's have a look at the close up here. The Benji came out pretty well. I didn't do any tweaking and changing of settings in Cura. I just used the default setting for the NF3 Pro actually, because there isn't yet a V2 profile in Cura, and that print came out really, really nice without any visible issues, any ringing or any stringing. The second test print I did was this Christmas ornaments. These are printed in vase mode, turned out really, really nice. Then I've printed this weird ways from Geeky Fay two times actually, because in the first run I ran into some issues specifically in the higher parts of that print. And I realized that I had some layer shifting and layer skipping and I wanted to find out why. And it turned out that I had to enable Z-Hop on Retract to get rid of these issues. And doing the second one with the Z-Hop enabled, it really turned out beautiful. And it's a really challenging print on any printer. Don't get me wrong. This is gonna put any printer to a really hard test. You also have to do this very slow. So you can't print it at 50 or 60 millimeters. You have to go down to 25 or 15 millimeters per second to really get a good result. Then we have two more parts. One was the pen holder. This turned out really nice. No visible issues, no layer issues, no ringing issues. That shows me that the default setup of this printer and also the sturdiness of the frame and having belt tensioners improves the first time results very much. So you don't have to do any kind of tweaking in the software anymore. Everything runs really, really smooth. I also wanted to test printing very small parts. And this is an example. This is the Mandalorian figure and it's just 2.5 centimeters high default for any kind of miniature prints. The quality turned out, I would say average. Some of you mentioned in the comments of that video that I released showing the time-lapse video that it looks like crap. I think for an FDM printer, the result is okay. Of course, you will get better results on SLA printers. We're gonna see some SLA printing on this channel this year, but for the FDM printer, this is a pretty nice result, I would say. Still can be improved, of course. Last one of my test print is this battery dispenser, and this one turned out very, very nice. Why is this specifically good for seeing problems? Because it has this large curved area and normally you see in this large curved area issues with ringing and bell tangenting issues. And it turns out that this came out perfectly so there's not any issue at all. Now let's talk about print speed. The print speed on this printer is pretty average. Compared to the previous models, you can go for 50 to 60 millimeters per second for the best results. Of course, you can print faster, like printing on 100 or 120 millimeters per second, but this will also degrade the quality of your prints. But that is expected. And I say the print speed on this printer is good enough. A few words on noise levels. So by default, this printer is not really silent. Although you might think that because it has silent drivers, in general, this printer is a pretty noisy one. So if you're in the same room when this printer is running, this is going to be a disturbing noise. After 150 hours of almost uninterrupted printing, I didn't turn off the printer in that whole time, by the way. I turned it off for just a few hours and then I turned it on again and the fans started to make these creepy noises. Clearing this noise tells me that the bearings of those fans are already wearing down pretty fast. So these are probably the first parts that you need to replace on the sprinter if you want to get rid of that noise. However, about two minutes later, the fans started turning normally, but I think the problem is going to increase over time. In general, I would say if you want to make this printer really silent and if you've seen my V1 upgrade video where I did all the fan upgrades, it's going to require a lot of changes in terms of replacing the hot end fan, the cooling fan, the electronics case fan. All these things need to be changed to really get a silent printer and I'm not sure if that is worth the effort on this printer. You better put it in a room where it's running alone um, and not run it in your bedroom. I was also interested to see how fast this printer can heat up the hot end and also the print bed to the desired print temperatures and heating up to 200 degrees Celsius on the hot end and at the same time heating up the hot bed to 60 degrees Celsius took about 3 minutes and 14 seconds. Just alone the hot end heating up time was 2 minutes and 8 seconds. 
Compared to the previous versions, the Pro and the V1, this isn't much different. I think because of the glass bed, it's a little bit longer, just a few seconds, so it's not a big change. I also ran into two issues during my test sprints. The first one being that the extruder gear that transports the filament into the tube, over time it made its way up on that motor shaft because it wasn't tight enough. This actually happened two times until I managed to get it so tight that it didn't move up anymore. So this is something to watch out for if you build the printer to get those little grub screws really tight and so this doesn't happen to you. The second issue that I see already happening here is that the rubber wheels on the X and Y axis are already degrading pretty fast. I can only imagine that this has to do with them being too tight against the extrusions from factory. I didn't change the tightening of these rubber wheels against the extrusion in the build. I might have done it um, if I knew that they were too tight. I was expecting this to happen at some point, but not so soon. Anyways, this is normal about that kind of printer and over time you will have to exchange those rubber wheels maybe after a year or so. This is quite normal. Now looking at those results, there's a few things that I would change on this printer. Some are more important and some less. So I would start with the more important things. I would add a filament sensor to this printer because I print a lot and I run into filament runout problems all the time because spools get empty and then you are happy to have that kind of sensor. Another upgrade might be a better spool holder because I have different kind of spools. They are smaller and larger and specifically the wide ones are prone to fall from that holder. So you have to place them on the side of the printer in that case and I will change this filament spool holder for a better one. Another thing to change is a filament guide because filament runs down to the extrusion system here and if it's a little bit older and gets brittle it's also prone to crack because of the tension that's generated by the, the extruder pulling down on that filament. That's another change to do I think and we need to enable some of the missing features in the firmware. I can also imagine a few upgrades that are not necessarily important, but also nice to have. For example, a metal gear extrusion system, either a single gear or a dual drive, that might improve results with TPU, for example. If you wanna have a touch screen instead of this, non-touch screen, you will probably have to change also the mainboard for something like a big tree tag mainboard. I'm not sure if this is an upgrade that's really necessary. I'm pretty happy with the results from this screen still, although it doesn't have the best uh, contrast, but I'm using Octoprint, so I'm not using the printer display all the time, so it's not really important. Then on the cooling system side, I would say better filament cooling is an upgrade that's worth looking into, either a modified version of the Hiromi or any other previous upgrade that I did on the V1 adapted to the V2 might be an improvement in terms of filament cooling. And then if you wanna get rid of the Bowden system because you wanna do faster printing or TPU printing with higher speeds, it might be worth looking into the Hamura direct drive extrusion system or the BiQ H2 system, which I'm gonna test in the future. Final conclusion, I would say for a printer at that price, this is probably the printer for 2021 for beginners and people who don't have a previous model already. But if you have the pro version, specifically the pro version, I would say you would better upgrade that pro version with a few changes like the bare tensioning system and a different mainboard and a touchscreen instead of getting the V2. But if you're just starting new, then I think the V2 is the perfect start into the 3D printing hobby. It still has the same great community around it for upgrades. Most of the previous version's parts that you find on Thingiverse and other places can be adapted to the V2 pretty much unchanged most of the time. You can get the Ender 3 V2 already for about 200 US dollars or a little bit more, depending on where you look and when you look for it. I've also put some links in the description for you to buy it. Thanks for using those links. If you like this video, maybe you want to watch two of my other videos that I've linked up here for you, and I see you in the next one. Bye!